Tuttle's story is a legend, a living legend, a legend that will live long after lots of other living legends have died. Tonight, we are extremely proud to present the semi-legendary life story of the Prefab Four, Dirk, Nasty, Stig, and Barry, who made the 60s what they are today, the fabulous Ruttles. <laughs> streets, very close to the cavern Rutland, came the fabulous Rutland sound, created by the prefab four Dirk, Nasty, Stig and Barry, who created a musical legend that will last a lunchtime. They were discovered by their manager, Leggy Mountbatten, in a lunchtime disco very close to these streets. Their first album was made in 20 minutes. The second took even longer. Tonight, we examine the legend of the Ruttles. We look at their lives, their loves, their music. We examine some of the problems that made them what they are today. And we shall also be asking some of the people who worked with them whether they were really the sort of lovable people they were made out to be. We shall be asking many people who knew them what they were really like. When I fell for you, I didn't need a show. Now that we are two, it all entire legend of the Ruttles. But where did the story start? The answer is right here. For on this very spot, Ron Nasty and Dirk McQuickly first bumped into each other. At this precise point, uh, just a few feet back here, Ron Nasty invited Dirk to help him stand up. Dirk, merely an amateur drinker, agreed. And here, well, a few feet back there, a musical legend was created. They were soon joined by their guitarist, Stig O'Hara, a school leaver of no fixed hairstyle. But it would not be for another two years before they found their drummer, Barrington Womble, hiding in the van. When they did, they persuaded him to change his name to save time and his haircut to save brawl cream. He became simply Barry Wom.
In October 1961, Leggy Mountbatten, a retail chemist from Bolton, entered their lives. Leggy had lost a leg in the RAF in the closing overs of World War II and had been hopping around Liverpool ever since. As a child, Leggy's mother never allowed him to play with the other little boys. His father was so snobby, he wore swimming trunks in the bath to stop him looking down on the unemployed. But it was here, in Liverpool, that... But it was in Liverpool that we spoke with Leggy's mother, Mrs Iris Mountbatten. Um, well, he told me that he'd uh, been to see these young men in a dark cellar. Yes. He was always very interested in young men. Oh, yes. Youth clubs, Boy Scouts, that sort of thing. Yes, yes. But um, these, he said, were different. In what way? Well, um, the hair and uh, the presents, the music. He liked it? No, he hated it. Well, what did he like? Well, um, uh, the trousers. What about their trousers? Well, they were, uh, they were very, um, tight. Tight? Yes, you could see quite clearly. Oh, I see. Everything. Outlines. Clear as day. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. So, tight trousers and Nothing's noise. left to the imagination. Yes, thank you. I'm standing in the world's naughtiest street, the notorious Reeperbahn Hamburg. For four hungry working class lads, there are worse places than prison. And the rat keller, Hamburg, is one of these. This is where they found themselves, far from home and far from talented. Inside here is where they actually played. Come with me now, inside, or as the Germans say, mit mir gekommen, inside. In those early days, there was a fifth ruttle, Lepo, a friend of Nasty's from art college, who mainly used to stand at the back. He couldn't play the guitar, but he knew how to have a good time. And in Hamburg, that was more important. I'm standing in the original rat killer. And indeed, these are some of the original rats. It was to this small back room that Dirk, Stig, Nasty, Barry and Lepo came to relax when they weren't upstairs entertaining the other rats dining in the other rat keller. Here they had bed and breakfast. There's the bed, the breakfast of course long since gone. Rodently chewed, mouse masticated, in a word, eaten by rats. Here one weekend Lepo crawled into a small trunk with a small German Fraulein and was never seen again. Incidentally, rat keller means literally, in German, cellar of rats. Now, that's not cellar of rats, a cellar of rats, a person who sells rats for a living to another man, as it were, of course not. That means a cellar full of rats. Indeed, one might say that this was a cellar full of rattles. <laughs> in October 19... Ah, uh, hello. Oh dear, there's a rat up my leg. In October 1961, Leggy was busy hopping round London trying to sell their tapes. Well, uh, one day this rather odd chap hopped into the office. He'd, uh, he'd been to see virtually everyone in the business and been shown the door. He asked to see my door, but I, uh, I wouldn't show it to him. Instead, he showed me the photographs and uh, tapes of the Ruttles. They were pretty rough, but they had something. What was it? I think it was the trousers. Well, I liked the trousers right away. I mean, I'd been in the garment trade and I knew a thing or two about inseams and uh, these were winners. Dick Jaws, an unemployed music Sign publisher of no fixed hour. ability, signed them up for the rest of their lives. Lucky, really. Number one, number one. Leggy Mountbatten, in his autobiography, A Cellar Full of Goys, wrote of the excitement of those early days when they rode the go-kart to fame and took the ferry across the Mersey to a land of riches, wealth and heartache. Leggy put them into suits. 
He put them into the recording studio and he put them into the newspapers. For the Ruttles, success was only a drumbeat away. Who did? Those little girls. And one of them screamed in my ear. Between us, nothing can come, nothing can come between us. I asked Mick Jagger when he first became aware of the Ruttles. Mm, we were living in, you know, squalor. We didn't have any money and we saw these. There were the rattles on the TV with girls chasing and we thought, this can't be that difficult, so we thought we'd have a go ourselves. What's your ambition? Uh, I'd like to be a hairdresser or two. I'd like to be two hairdressers. First time at the rattles, they came down to see us at, at, at Richmond and they uh, and we were just completely a number, you know, and they, and they all suddenly, they were standing there in their black suits. They'd just come off uh, a TV show and uh, they were just standing there, sort of checking us out, the opposition. And then they introduced themselves, you know, Dirt, Stig, Nasty, Barry. I'd like to hold a squadron of tanks. Uh, they were very nice, you know, because uh, they'd heard about us, you know, because we were the South's answer to the rattles, you know, at that time. What Ron and I'll do is probably to write some songs, you know, and sell them to people. Uh, we tried to write some for the... Uh, the Rolling Stones, and they're probably going to buy them. The one for that was Dirk, really. He was a real hustler for the songs, I think. You know, always wanted to sell a song, you know, for any demand, didn't want any old slag, he'd send a song to write one, sit up. Okay, they came down, they came down, and we were trying to rehearse, and they said, do you want a song? We said, yeah, we're always really open for songs, because we didn't write our own. And, of course, the Rattlers were always well-known for their hit-making potential ability. Right. And so they ran around the corners of the pub to write this song and came back with it and played it to us. And um, it was horrible. And so we never bothered to record it. It was a busy week for the Prefab Four as the fever of Rottlemania rolls over England. Monday saw them arriving for a civic reception given by the Mayor and Corporation of Liverpool to say thank you to its famous four sons. On Tuesday, Ruttlemania comes to London as Ruttles fans jam Piccadilly Circus and bring London's traffic to a standstill. Nobody's seen anything quite like this since the war. Look out, girls. Here come the Ruttles. 
And for some, the event is clearly too much. Oh well, she's safe in the arms of the law. First to arrive is Ruttles fan, Princess Margaret, escorted by her husband, Lord Snowden, Tony Armstrong Jones. Her Majesty herself is there to greet the Ruttles on this royal glittering occasion, the annual Royal Command Performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'd like to do a number dedicated to a very special lady in the audience tonight, Barry's mum. <laughs> and now, without any more ado, here's your own, your very own, Dirk McQuickly. Shoot me down in flames if I should tell a lie. Cross my heart, I promise that it's true. I've been in love so many times before. But never with a girl like you With a girl like you To hold and be beside With a girl like you To fill my heart with pride and joy With a girl a Ruttles fan, and she enjoyed the performance so much that on Wednesday they went back to her place to receive MBEs. Well done, lads. England's proud of you. It must have been a great honor meeting the Queen. Yeah, it must have been. What did she ask you? She asked us who we were. And what did you say? <laughs> I said I was him. I felt more like him than me. Do you feel better after seeing the Queen? No, you feel better after seeing the Doctor. Not my doctor, you don't. Not your doctor, no. <laughs> what are you going to do now? Back to your place. But all rest and no play makes Ruttles dull boys. And on Thursday, they fly to America to see if they were more than nine-day wonders. They needn't have worried. America loves Ruttles, too. In many cases, even more. 10,000 girls are here to say hello to these four guys from Liverpool. It was the most famous arrival on these shores since Christopher Columbus. Hello there. Thanks a lot. Bye. After briefly greeting the press, they drive into the heart of Manhattan to get their first glimpse of New York. It's Reynolds Day in Flushing, ladies and gentlemen. WC, WC, the Flushing. You've got to twist and run. It's soft in the air, it sounds like. Come on, Flushing animals, what do you want to know? What do you want to hear if you call me up? at 555-2160 and say you won't hear anything but the Reynolds, I'm going to come looking for you. I mean it, because it's Reynolds Day. They're going to be here tomorrow talking about their trousers. It's a big, big day here in Flushing. Let's give them a big round of applause. I know I can't hear you, but I know I can pick up what you're saying, baby. The scene is here in Flushing. The whole world's eyes are on Flushing because the Prefab Four are coming to town tomorrow to talk about their trousers. We well, I don't know about this. Do you know about this? No. New York City. And then it's back to the hotel for a bit of fun and games. This is us having breakfast. But it's oh, all in a day's work for England's ambassadors of musical fun, the Rottles. How about you, Barry? Uh, not too many. That's so good. I'm actually standing outside the actual hotel in which the Rottles actually stayed in 1964 actually in this room here and it was actually inside this actual room that i actually spoke with the actual paul simon we saw the show and i remember sullivan was saying that people calm down now everyone calm down you know or we can't hear or some some kind of silly warning you know and they they opened the show i think and they also closed the show which i thought was like a sort of astute planning on sullivan's part because 
It would have made you very angry if you had to sit through the whole show to wait to see the Ruddles, you know. So they clearly everyone would tune into that that week's show just to see the Ruddles. So. Now, yesterday and today, our theater has been jammed with newspapermen and hundreds of photographers from all over the nation. And these veterans agree with me that the city never has witnessed the excitement stirred by these youngsters from Liverpool who call themselves the Ruddles. Now, tonight, you're going to twice be entertained by them. Right now, and again in the second half of our show, ladies and gentlemen, the Ruddles. Let's hear it, Bob. The Ruttles' music, meanwhile, had been attracting respectable critical attention. The London Times called it the best since Schubert. Sir Brian Morrison has been Regis Professor of Music at the University of Oxford for the past 30 years. We asked him just how good, musically, were the Ruttles. Stanley J. Cramerhead III, Jr. is an occasional visiting professor of applied narcotics at the University of Please Yourself, California. He is also a keen historian of pop music. We asked him just how good musically were the Ruttles. Listen, look at very simply, musicologically and ethnically, the, the Ruttles were essentially empirical melanges of a rhythmically radical, yet verbally passe and temporarily transcended lyrical content, welded with historically innovative melodical material, a transposed and transmogrified by the uh, angst of the Rutland ethnic experience, which elevated them from essentially alpha exponents of, in essence, merely beta potential harmonic material, into the prime cultural exponents of Aeolian cadenzic cosmic stanza form. But he didn't really tell us either. <sighs> so, we went to New Orleans to find out just how expensive it is to make these documentaries. I'm standing by the banks of the Mississippi. The first na I'm standing by the banks of the Mississippi in Louisiana, the cradle of the blues. That's black music sung mainly by whites. And we're here to find out the black origins of Ruttle music. I spoke with Blind Lemon Pie. Well, everything I learned, I learned from the Ruttles. From the Ruttles, really? Yes, everything. But surely you were singing the blues back in the early 30s? No, I was working on the railroad. I worked on the railroad for 30 years or more until I heard the riddles. Then I decided that that's my type of music. I'm going to leave the railroad and I became a musician. 
and I've been starving ever since. So, where did Ruttle music originate? Next door. Next door? Next door to Ruttle and Orange Peel. Yes, sir. I originated the Ruttle. They got it all from me, every single bit of it. Well, how do you mean? Well, sir, they come here and they took everything they ever written. The four guys from Liverpool came here. He's lying. I ain't lying. He's always I lying. Ain't lying. I ain't lying. Every time there's a documentary on white music around here, he claims he started it I did, I did, I did. I Last did. week, he claimed he started the Ebony Brothers, Frank Sinatra, and Lawrence Welch. I did. I He's did. always lying. Well, we seem to be rather wasting our time here in New Orleans despite the expense. Still, pretty, isn't it? Nasty had written and published a best-selling book, Out of Me Head. Only one media remained unconquered, the cinema. In 1965, a hard day's rut changed all that. I feel good, I feel bad, I feel happy, I feel sad. Am I in love or am I in love? I must be in love. I feel rich, I feel poor, I'm in doubt, I feel sure, I'm in love, I must be in love. Any time of the day, I can see, I can see her face when I close my eyes. She's a dream, she's a dream, she is real, she is real. Can't explain. Roger McGough is a Liverpool poet. He's the author of many books set in and around Liverpool, including Mersey Sound, Gig, The Liverpool Scene, and two of his Liverpool poems are in the Oxford book of 20th century English verse. He was born in Liverpool, attended school in Liverpool, was even married in Liverpool, and his football team is, of course, Everton. He's a member of The Scaffold, a light comedy group who played the cavern during the early 60s. And during those incredible years, he lived, wrote, loved, watched football and drank in Liverpool. Roger, did you know the Ruttles? Oh, yes, yes. Roger McGough, Liverpool poet, writer, author, humorist, bon viveur, and a man who knew the Ruttles. You. Australia, Canada, Cleveland. The Ruttles were now worldwide successes. They'd rub shoulders with the great. Their pictures were everywhere. Their names endorsed a thousand products from T-shirts, to garter belts, to pillowcases. Leggy was besieged by merchandisers. We felt every girl in America is going to want to sleep with a Ruttle. Yes, we have a complete line of Ruttle products all ready to go. The Ruttle T-shirt, the Ruttle plate, the Ruttle cup, the uh, Ruttle uh, acne cream, the Ruttle uh, hair clips, all a complete line of Ruttle products. And all I need from you is just your word and uh, we're in business. We're in business. I like the way you work. Brian Thigh was a top record executive in London in 1962. Mr. Thigh, you've been known for many, many years as the man who turned down the Ruttles. <coughs> yeah, that's right. You said that guitar groups were on their way out and would never make any money at all in the 60s. 
Yes, I did. You turned your back on all those millions of sales, all those hundreds of gold records. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. What's it like to be such an asshole? <laughs> what? Some people say uh, you've been staying away from Liverpool, now you're famous. Oh, we haven't been staying away so much, it's not coming here. Uh, some people say it's six months since you came back here. Well, that's just the sort of thing some people would say. Nevertheless, it has been six months. Now you're saying it, why don't you ask me where I've been? Where have you been? I'm not telling you. I grew up in the country Beside a chicken shack So I left the city And I didn't look back Now I'm living in home Living in home Living in home Living in home Yes, I'm living in home Living in home Living in home At the height of Ruttlemania in 1965 Their drummer, Barry Wong, the noisy one returned home to Liverpool to marry his childhood sweetheart. The church was packed with Ruttle fans, all of whom wanted to get a close look at the Ruttles. Inside the dimly lit, crowded church, Barry got separated from his fiancée and ended up with a different bride. In the confusion, Barry's bride-to-be, 23-year-old butcher's apprentice Brenda Lyola, was accidentally married to a party of Scotsmen from Hull, inspiring Barry's haunting ballad, When You Find the Girl of Your Dreams in the Arms of Some Scotsman from Hull. Barry was heartbroken, but when he looked up and saw who he'd married, he soon cheered up. Welcome back. And it's from Liverpool that we go immediately to London. Hello. London here. And it's from London that we go to Switzerland. To the Ruttles' second movie, Ouch. Filmed in colour, on location, very expensively, not in London. Ouch, you're breaking my heart. Ouch, I'm falling apart. Ouch, ow, ow, ouch. When we first met, I must admit, I fell for you right on the top. Seems upset the apple cart All kinds of things It seems upset the apple cart Ouch Don't desert me Ouch You don't hurt me Ouch Ow, ow, ow Ouch Don't desert me Ouch Please don't hurt me Ouch Ow, ow, ow Shea Stadium named after the Cuban guerrilla leader, Shea Stadium. And it was here, in 1965, that the Ruttles came, well, not uh, here in the car park, obviously, but um, back there in the stadium, that the Ruttles came, in 1965, to a capacity house, a sellout. But I mean, the thing I remember about it is them running out in the middle of this field and you couldn't see them. There they were, like, you know, just miles away. There, is it really the Ruttles? <laughs> it might be somebody else. <laughs> Look 
they play? About 20 minutes. And that was it. Off. Helicopter. Back to the Warwick Hotel. Two birds each. In 1966, the Ruttles faced the biggest threat to their careers. Nasty, in a widely quoted interview, apparently had claimed that the Ruttles were bigger than God, and had gone on to say that God had never had a hit record. At times like these, when enemies can no the story spread like wildfire in America. Many fans burnt their albums. Many more burnt their fingers attempting to burn their albums. Album sales skyrocketed. People were buying them just to burn them. But in fact, it was all a ghastly mistake. Nasty, talking to a slightly deaf journalist, had claimed only that the Ruttles were bigger than Rod. Rod Stewart would not be big for another eight years. That's all I said, you know. Now all this has to happen. How do you think it proves? I think it proves you're all daft. I suppose I'll get into trouble for saying that now. Nasty apologised to God, Rod and the press, and the tour went ahead as planned. But it would be the Ruttles' last. Well, we'll be playing all the places where we're supposed to play, and we hope we can, uh, you know, bring uh, a bit of, uh, you know, if you're going to say qua to uh, America again. At the end of it, they met Bob Dylan in the idyllic San Francisco of the mid-60s. And he introduced them to a strange substance that was to have an enormous effect on them. Tea. Despite warnings that it would lead to stronger things, the Ruttles enjoyed the pleasant effects of tea. And it influenced enormously their greatest work, Sergeant Rutter. Of course, the main thing that comes to my mind with the Sergeant Rutter album is uh, getting stoned and listening to it with the earphones, you know. Particularly, the, you know, the, the chord that lasted forever, you know. The release of this album, a millstone in pop music history, contributed greatly to an idyllic summer of bells, flowers and tea drinking. Its music led thousands to experiment with tea. Eventually, even the press found out and offered Dirk the chance to deny it. It's, it's not up to me. If you come to me and ask me, I'm going to tell you the truth. Because it is the truth. I have had tea. Lots of tea. Indian tea. And biscuits. Dirk's admission created a scandal. The press grabbed hold of the wrong end of the stick and started to beat about the bush with it. Many pop stars were arrested for using and possessing tea. Nasty himself was busted by Detective Inspector Brian Plant, who brought his own to be on the safe side. There was an immediate outcry against this police persecution, and the London Times carried a full-page petition calling for the legalisation of tea. Rattles, meanwhile, appeared live on TV before a worldwide audience of 200 million, 
with a song that expressed the feeling of the age. Tea was on everyone's lips. form there of choral music with a slight difference. Uh, we'll be back with Prince Charles in just a moment. Love Life is in many ways the high watermark of their careers. From here, the sands of time ebbed, leaving them high and dry on the beach of time as the tide of history rolled relentlessly over them. For a start, Leggy Mountbatten was rapidly becoming a worry. Always emotionally involved with them, he had far less to do once they ceased touring. Of course, he had other artistes, the Machismo brothers, Arthur Hodgson and the Kneecaps, as well as the French Beach Boys, Les Garçons de la Plage. But his decision to put money into bullfighters as a tax dodge, plus his unusual personal life, in California he'd been arrested for giving the kiss of life to a rubber raft, gave increasing grounds for concern. I asked Mick Jagger if he was aware of these tendencies of Leggy's. Oh, yeah. Uh, Leggy, yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> Leggy got around a bit, you know. And that was all right, you know, until he started going off with the bullfighters, I think, that, that, that era. And then I think they got a bit disenchanted with him and he didn't know where to go, you know, and, you know, in his life, I think. And they wanted to control more themselves, you know. Stig, meanwhile, had fallen under the influence of Arthur Sultan, the Surrey mystic. And Sultan had introduced Stig to his Ouija board work. Arthur Sultan now invited the Ruttles on a get-away-from-it-all, table-tapping weekend near Bognor. As usual, the press followed. The Bogner thing was really funny. The Bogner Express, they called it in the newspaper. Someone was very late, one of the girls, they're always late. One of them, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was uh, nasty. So we were trying to get on the Russell's bandwagon, you know, the Russell's mystical bandwagon, which wasn't true at all. We were just as eager to find out what was going on in this board tapping thing at Bogner as anybody. <laughs> While the Ruttles sat at the feet of the Surrey mystic, fate dealt them an appalling blow. It was here that they learned the shocking news of their manager. Leggy Mountbatten, tired and despondent over the weekend and unable to raise any friends, went home and 
tragically accepted a teaching post in Australia. It was a kind of funny weekend that, and then of course uh, at the end of it, uh, we, we found out that uh, Beggy had gone off to Australia, which kind of put the mockers on the whole thing, really. It was a bombshell for the Ruttles. They were shocked and stunned. Well, we're shocked. Yeah, shocked. Shocked. And stunned. Yeah, stunned. Very stunned. Did Arthur Sultan have any words of encouragement for you? No. Well, yeah. Well, yeah and no. Uh, he, he said uh, that it took all sorts to make a world and that we shouldn't worry unduly about uh, where he'd gone. You know, we shouldn't become covered with grief at thoughts of Australia. Because... He's... He did say that we could still keep in touch with him, you know, by uh, tapping the table. And postcards. Yeah. Very stunned. Very stunned. It's significant that their first major flop, the Tragical History Tour, immediately followed the loss of Leggy. It was not the strongest idea for a Ruttles film. Four Oxford history professors on a hitchhiking tour of tea shops in the Rutland area, and it was slammed mercilessly by the press. rented limousine in New York and it was here well not in the limousine obviously but but in New York that the Ruttles came in 1968 to announce the formation of Ruttle Corps. We're here in New York to announce the formation of Ruttle Corps. Uh, Nasty and I have, have come over on behalf of the other Ruttles. Yeah they couldn't come. Yeah uh. we, we're setting up Ruttle Corps uh, as a kind of enterprise that people can come to us and we'll help them, we'll, we'll give them money. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they want money, they just come to us. Yeah, instead of going to a bank. 
Yeah. You know, we want to help people to help themselves. Ruttlecore did just that. People helped themselves for years. At one stage, they were losing money faster than the British government. There have been continued allegations that Ruttle Corps is going bankrupt. Eric Manchester, the Ruttle's press agent, are these allegations true? No, no. No, they're, uh, they're conjecture, you know. They're, they're sort of rumour. I think you find that where you get success, you'll always find this sort of rumour. No. So the stories of the theft, they're not true also? Uh, no, they're greatly exaggerated, greatly exaggerated. Uh, it's bad, you know. Things are going. But uh, nothing like the rate that, that people indicate. The trouble is that people feel that because, because these boys are the Ruttles, people can come in and just help themselves to whatever they want. And this is just not on. And we're putting a stop to this, and we are doing, you know, it, it, it's almost dried up. Uh, things have gone. I won't deny it. Television sets. The odd car belonging to the company has, uh, has disappeared. But uh, it's not extreme, you know. Oh, well, I did come in once. I found that my office had been nicked. Mm -hmm. But it had been nicked by, uh, by Ron Decline, who we'd called in to stop this sort of uh, flow of goods from the building, so that was all right. Mm. So once you see this stop, do you feel that Ruttle Coal will continue into the future? Absolutely. I feel that once we've put a stop to this sort of bit of petty pilfering, Ruttle Coal will last for a very, very... For a while, three chapters of the Redditch Hells Angels lived in the basement at Ruttlecourt before Stig had the nerve to ask them to leave. Who hurt Stig? One of the girls. Who? Big Valerie. We're very upset, but there's not much we can do about it. Why not? Well, she'll thump me. So, Stig injured by Big Valerie. The Ruttles next opened a clothes boutique in London which lost nearly a million dollars in only three weeks, before Nasty blew it up. problems now began to split the Ruttles into smithereens. They would sing together, but they wouldn't talk. 
pretty soon they wouldn't even sing. By March 1969, things had got so bad within the group that both Dirk and Nasty got married. Well, not to each other, of course, uh, to women. Dirk had become enamored of Martini, a French actress who spoke no English and precious little French. When they married in London, the service was conducted in Spanish, Italian and Chinese to be on the safe side. Hugh, I love you, I love, I love, it's you I love. Today is our wedding day, for you always I will wait. D. 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 Naturally, people come and people go naturally. Let's be natural. Nasty, meanwhile, visited an exhibition of broken art at the pretentious gallery Soho. The art exhibits had all been dropped out of tall buildings and then put on display. Amongst the little piles of rubble, Nasty found the artist herself. Chastity, a simple German girl whose father had invented World War II. Chastity fascinated him with her destructo art. They talked all through the night as she outlined her plans to drop artists out of planes. Nasty adored her. They announced their engagement next day at a press conference held in his shower. What are you doing this for? We're doing this for peace and basically to show that the world is, you know, going astray and it's thinking. Um, what are you doing? We are getting wet in a shower because basically we talked it over, Chastity and myself, and we came to the conclusion that... Uh, Civilization was nothing more than an effective sewage system. And so by the use of plumbing, we hope to demonstrate this to the world. Nasty and Chastity now plunged themselves into the art world. Together, they made a film called A Thousand Feet of Film. Meanwhile, had hidden in the background so much that in 1969 a rumour went around that he was dead. He was supposed to have been killed in a flash fire at a waterbed shop and replaced by a plastic and wax replica from Madame Tussauds. Several so-called facts helped the emergence of this rumour. One, he, he never said anything publicly. Even as the quiet one, he'd not said a word since 1966. Two, on the cover of their latest album, Shabby Road, he's wearing no trousers, an Italian way of indicating death. 
Three, Nasty supposedly sings I Buried Stig on I Am The Waitress. In fact, he sings A Burestiano, which is very bad Spanish for Have You A Water Buffalo. Four, on the cover of the Sergeant Rutter album, Stig is leaning in the exact position of a dying yeti from the Rutland Book of the Dead. Five, if you sing the title of Sergeant Rutter's only darts club band backwards, it's supposed to sound very like Stig has been dead for ages, honestly. In fact, it sounds uncannily like Danab, Bulk, Ilno, Stretter, Tenegris. Palpable nonsense. Stig was, of course, far from dead, although not, in fact, far from Isha. He had fallen in bed with Gertrude Strange, a large-breasted, biologically accommodating American girl whose father had invented the limpid mine. When they met, it was lust at first sight. Barry, meanwhile, had also spent a year in bed as a tax dodge. Eric Manchester thinks he had either received appalling financial advice or he was desperately trying to start a Barry is also dead rumour. When he finally got up, Ruttlecore was in a perilous financial plight. Nasty had flown back in a hurry from his honeymoon rally in Nuremberg to meet the most feared promoter in the world. Ron Decline. Klein had a reputation as a hard man. His only weak spot was dishonesty. Anyone was free to inspect his books, but no one could find his accounts. He struck terror into the hearts of his subordinates. People would commit suicide rather than meet him. In business, his left hand never knew who his right hand was doing. Nasty adored him. He was a man after his own wallet. Klein promised the Ruttles that if they let him take care of their royalties, they would never have to worry about money again. Stig, meanwhile, was accepting the financial advice of Billy Kodak, whilst Dirk had invited Arnold Schwarzenweissen, Green and Brown and Bluenberger to handle his end of the name, and Barry was consulting the I Ching every three and a half minutes. There was a plethora of lawyers. Suddenly, everyone became amazingly litigious. I remember I'd get up in the morning, sue someone, check in the papers I hadn't been fired, go to the office, sue someone, pick up the morning's writs, sue the bank, go out for lunch, sue the restaurant, get back in, collect the writs that had been received that afternoon, read the papers, phone the papers, sue the papers, and go home, sue the wife. You ask me, where's the money, where's the money? I mean, I don't know where the money is. I've never been good with figures, you know that. I don't know anything about math. It was never my good subject. I don't know where the money is, but if you need money, I'll give you money. But this, this really surprises me. I'm really shocked. Because I thought we had something here a lot stronger than just business. <sighs> I mean, you know, I love you more than I love my own family. I do. I want to protect you. I want to help you. I want to protect you from the outside world. Protect you protect you from people like me, you know. And I think I'm doing a good job. At the final meeting, 134 legal people and accountants filed into a small eight by 10 room. Only 87 came out alive. The black hole of Savile Row had taken toll of some of the finest merchant banking brains of a generation. Luckily, that's not very serious, but the Ruttles were obviously self-destructing fast. In the midst of all this public bickering, Let It Rot was released as a film, an album, and a lawsuit. In 1970, Dirk sued Stig, Nasty, and Barry. Barry sued Dirk, Nasty, and Stig. Nasty sued Barry, Dirk, and Stig. And Stig sued himself accidentally. It was the beginning of a golden era for lawyers. But for the Ruttles, live on a London rooftop, it was the beginning of the end. Dun, two, three, four.
Come along, come along, you're under arrest. Come on, get going. Come on, come on, come on, come on, Like any of the other enormous music, popular music phenomena, Sinatra and Presley and the Ruddles, and then you know, so some people say, well, you know, it's time every ten years who will be who will be the next Ruddles. You know, but I don't think there will be a next Ruddles. Sixteen years after the fresh-faced Prefab Four first burst into the public eye, and eight years after they split up, just where are the Ruddles today? Dirk has formed with his wife Martini a punk rock group. Called the Punk Floyd, he sings and she doesn't. <coughs> Nasty has turned his back on the world and sits with his thoughts and his memories. Barry is a hairdresser in the Reading area with two fully equipped salons of his own. While Stig works for Air India as an air hostess. Fame is a fickle mistress. Just how many people even remember the Ruttles today? We asked the public, just what is a Ruttle? Excuse me, madam, we're doing a documentary, and I wonder if you'd answer a few questions. No, I'm sorry, I don't answer questions. Oh, it won't take a second of your time, really. We just got the camera rolling right away here. Hurry, uh, we're from England, we're making a documentary. We just want one question, please. All right. Thank you very much. Just stand right here, okay? Who were the Ruttles? I don't know. Come on, you must know. No, I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, yes, you do know. No, well, I don't know. Who are the Ruttles? I don't know. You do know. No, I don't know. You do know the Ruttles, you I know. I don't know who they are. Who are the Ruttles? Please tell us. I'm sorry, I don't know who they are. Who are the Ruttles? I don't know. You do know. I don't. You do know. Who are I the Ruttles? Know. I don't know who the... But who are the Ruttles? The Ruttles were a mop-top English pop quartet of the 60s who set the foot of the world to tapping with their catchy melodies, their wacky Liverpool humor, and their zany off-the-wall antics, epitomized in such movies as A Hard Day's Rut and Ouch. Dirk and Nasty, the acknowledged leaders of the group, were perfectly complimented by Stig, the quiet one, and Barry, the noisy one, to form a heartwarming, cheeky, lovable, talented, non-Jewish group who gladdened the hearts of the world. Thanks, in Bert. 1962, they played The Cavern. After that, they spent several months in Hamburg. Yes, thank then, you very much. In 1962, they released their first Thanks. single, Twist and Run. Yes, thank you very They're much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Will you shut up? From New York, back to London. I'm standing on the crossing where the Ruttles legend ended. Here it was that the Prefab Four, Dirk, Nasty, Stig and Barry, the Ruttles, the singing phenomena who made the 60s, what they are today, here it was, that indeed, here it was just... Mick, why do you think the Ruttles broke up? Why do I think they did? Why did the Ruttles break up? Women. Just women. Getting in the way. Cher Shalo fan, you know. Do you think they'll ever get back together again? I hope not. <laughs> 